Did you know there's no such thing as a normal headache? Headaches need a diagnosis. Our doctors can help. Welcome to the Heads Up Podcast, brought to you by the National Migraine Centre, the only UK charity treating migraine and headache. Hello, I'm Dr. Katie Monroe and I'm with Dr. Jessica Briscoe. Hi there. Today we're going to be talking about vestibular migraine. This is a form of migraine which is actually probably a lot more common than people realise. Often there's a big delay in diagnosing it, but it causes huge impact. Yeah, so I think we'll start off by talking about what vestibular migraine is. Essentially, I mean, there are diagnostic criteria which are mainly helpful for a study point of view, but they can be act as a as a guideline. So vestibular migraine is relating to those symptoms of vertigo that some people get during a migraine attack. So it has to be vestibular symptoms which tends to be vertigo lasting between five minutes and 72 hours and at least half of the episodes have to have been associated with some form of migraineous feature. So most people should have had a, a history of migraine or have some symptoms of migraine as well. So that can be the headache which is a typical migraine headache, the sensitivity to surrounding so light or sound sensitivity or visual aura as well. Yeah and I think dizziness we often hear that dizziness is a feature of an awful lot of people Mm. who are having migraine attacks Uh, but in people who are diagnosed with vestibular migraine the, the dizziness is very much a predominant symptom and can be incredibly disabling. Absolutely. So although the diagnostic criteria talk about anything lasting between five minutes and 72 hours. In some people, it can go on for days and days Mm. and be relentless, a bit like persistent aura, sometimes just doesn't go away and their lives are dominated by dizziness. Yeah, and I mean, I think we've sometimes seen it can be up to seven days, can't it? Yeah, yeah. And also, I think the interesting thing about vestibular migraine is a lot of people don't actually have a headache with it. And I think that can make it quite confusing and that can sometimes delay the diagnosis because we all know that most people think of migraine as a headache but actually the predominant feature in vestibular migraine does tend to be that room spinning dizziness the vertigo um if you count up how much vertigo there is in the general population uh, and look at the different types of conditions which are causing vertigo uh, there are a lot of studies that show that ve- vestibular migraine is is probably about one percent mm. but actually i think that's an underestimate and there's been some recent studies that show that in specialist clinics for dizziness probably a vestibular migraine is underdiagnosed and it may account for as much as 40 percent of people with that kind of presentation of dizziness yeah that's actually quite a lot that's i mean it's huge isn't it i think we we do see it quite a lot i always think the interesting thing about vestibular migraine is how long it takes people to become diagnosed so the thing i think everybody worries about when someone has a new episode of persistent vertigo is cerebellar strokes or brainstem strokes and I often see people who might have had that ruled out or had other causes of so other sort of acute or sudden onset causes of of vertigo ruled out and then they haven't necessarily responded well to treatment and people can be left for a long time with this persistent vertigo other quite disabling symptoms as well and not really know where they are so it, it can take quite a few months for them to even have that that label of vestibular migraine given to them. So uh, there is a, one particular other common condition which can cause dizziness that may cause confusion as well, and that's a thing called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and that's a very common thing as well. But it causes transient dizziness when people are either moving their head into different positions or very classically when they're turning over in bed that one is much more easily treated by a simple maneuver which um, most gps should be able to do but it it doesn't have the same uh, typical features that we see with uh, vestibular migraine which is that sort of sound and light sensitivity sometimes getting headaches and those other migraineous features so bppv as it's called is also something to be considered if you if you're uh, suffering from dizziness and and getting your doctor to check it out uh, but vestibular migraine is really right up there and should be thought about more often i tend to find that the thing that people have with vestibular migraine more than with bppv is that brain fog as well yes um and i think that's something that gets i think clinicians are sometimes bad at asking about it and yeah. i think people 
don't know how to describe it, so don't necessarily volunteer the information. Yes, that sort of cloudy-headed, um, fuzzy thinking. And sometimes with vestibular migraine, people also get a sensation of fullness mm. in their ear or a sensation of pressure. They can sometimes be diagnosed with another condition that causes dizziness, and that's Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease comes on in, in sudden attacks of dizziness, but it's also linked with deafness. Yeah, so typically that deafness, I mean, it's a trial isn't it it's the dizziness room spinning dizziness uh fullness in the ears and deafness so i think if a lot of people hear about fullness in the ear they will sort of an alarm bell will go off in mm. in, in the doctor's head and they'll think many ears um but that's probably overdiagnosed, isn't it i think it probably is we were listening to a, a consultant who specializes in this uh, speaking the other day and he was feeling very much that we should be thinking much more about vestibular migraine and raising awareness of that mm. uh, and that we're probably overdiagnosing many years which is a very important thing to to get the diagnosis of that right as well obviously but mm. if we are having a diagnosis of vestibular migraine then what do you normally try and advise people in terms of treatments so I think the key is to try and manage all of the symptoms. So you can try and acutely manage the symptoms. So the symptoms of dizziness, pain if people have it. But also, I, I very strongly feel that if someone's having recurrent episodes or persistent episodes of this, we should be trying to treat it as we do with frequent migraine. So for the the difficulty is vertigo doesn't tend to respond to triptans, which is our go to for most migraine mm. symptoms. They're much better with the pain aren't they yeah sometimes i find people do respond to aspirin but that can be transient do you ever use procloparazine or stamatil i think a lot of people have been given that because it, not only is it one that gps are used to prescribing but it, you can also buy it over the counter and mm. that sometimes people get stuck on it for a long period of time and i think one message that i, I would say is that people should only be trying it for a two or three day mm. short period of time it doesn't work very well in this kind of dizziness no it's good for nausea and it can be good for uh, other kinds of dizziness sometimes but for vestibular migraine it isn't really very effective and i think we also want to talk about which preventatives we tend to use are there any ones that you specifically use for vestibular migraine probably normally start off with the the usual ones that we try for any kind of migraineous process so the amitriptyline propranolol type things and then going on to some of the others i mean i think some of our patients have done quite well on flunarazine yeah. you know the whole range of treatments that we use for for migraine in, in general um, can be helpful in vestibular migraine and even things like greater occipital nerve blocks yeah uh, they may be helpful too i found occipital nerve blocks quite useful particularly if people are having persistent uh, frequent attacks again as you would do in in sort of other types of migraine at trying to sort of break that bout can mm. be quite useful whilst mm. you're waiting for the the preventative to take effect i suppose we also always need to emphasize with anybody with migraine that it is about reducing that background irritability of the brain and so eating regularly eating uh, low carb high fat high protein diets can be helpful making sure you're getting good quality sleep and regular hours of going to bed and waking in the morning um all those general things that we would usually advise can also be helpful in vestibular migraine absolutely what about vestibular rehabilitation uh, there are a lot of people it's a specific type of sort of physiotherapy and i think we're probably going to be talking to someone a bit more about that later yes we have a special guest later <laughs> but sometimes i'll see people who are in about of um vestibular migraine and they'll actually find that vestibular rehab hasn't been particularly useful for that um now there was actually a, a we sort of had that we were enlightened about that mm. at the um, lecture we went to the other week where actually the consultant was saying that it's better to to save vestibular rehab for when the bout has settled because if you actually do rehabilitation mm. during a bout it can bring on symptoms yeah one of the messages um about uh, vertigo is that migraine can give people dizziness and vertigo but also the other way around so if people are having tests to diagnose why they've got vertigo sometimes that can trigger a migraine mm. uh, so people have caloric tests where uh, they have uh, something uh, flushed into their ear or, well, or they, quite unpleasant. <laughs> it sounds quite d dramatic but uh, they did find that sometimes uh, a couple of days later people would have a migraine as a result of having the test so mm. 
I think the, the answer is that there's a lot of overlap with these symptoms and conditions, but we have to have a really low threshold for thinking about vestibular migraine and wondering whether this is the diagnosis when patients present with dizziness. I'm just wondering if this is a good point to talk about the ongoing, how we sort of carry on funding the podcast, actually, before we carry on with our next part of the, yes. the discussion. Um, so we wanted to say thank you to everyone who's donated so far, because yeah. we are a charity. Without um, without your help, we wouldn't be able to be doing these podcasts. We wouldn't be able to have our lovely special guests in as well. And we wouldn't be able to get slightly better sound equipment as yes, well. Yes, hopefully. Um, yes, so if you would like to give us a donation, large or small, uh, just go onto our page on Virgin Giving and that would be lovely. Thank you very much to everybody who's already done that. So there are a couple of other things we wanted to talk about with um, vestibular migraine. I often get asked, so some people say that they've been diagnosed with brainstem or migraines instead. And does it matter what you call it? Is there a difference between vestibular migraine and brainstem aura? I think you can get a little bit bogged down in the um, minutiae of what symptom is predominant. And I think the main message is really to to think about it as being a migraineous process mm. and to be getting to grips with that. Don't you agree? I completely agree. I mean, again, from a diagnostic, if you're looking at our guidelines about what exactly each diagnosis consists of, there is a lot of overlap anyway. Yeah, there is. Where the vestibular migraine can have um, tinnitus, visual aura, um, some of the um, paras, the, the yeah. numbness yeah. and tingling, word finding difficulties as well. And actually, they might have attacks where that doesn't happen. Yeah, actually, but it's, it's all about, migraine. It's yeah, all migraine. It's all migraine. Yeah. It's about focusing on the symptoms, trying to manage them as best mm-hmm. as possible. And I think it is useful for people to know that they have vestibular migraine. I think mm. people feel mm. happier knowing that they have that diagnosis. Yes. Um, but actually, you're right. Let's treat it. Let's treat migraine as migraine and try and tailor our treatment to, to uh, each their symptoms. individual. Yeah. There is another condition. Um, sometimes people who have had a traumatic brain injury, for example, in a road traffic accident or something like that, can develop dizziness afterwards. And sometimes this can lead to vestibular migraine symptoms um, but apparently in some studies they found that the, those kind of people had similar um, symptoms to migraine sometimes before the injury so that's also interesting isn't it that mm. maybe their um, brain was a little bit vulnerable and the brain injury led them on to get more specifically dizziness symptoms as part of their migraine picture yeah it's very interesting so it- in summary, I think yeah. uh, what we're saying sort of today is vestibular migraine is probably far more common um, than it's currently being diagnosed as. Sometimes the things that it's important to rule out are cerebellar strokes. Treating vestibular migraine is important, but we've we've got to try and treat the symptoms and treat it as we do other migraines in the sense that if it's frequent and recurrent, start preventatives nice yeah. and early um, to try and to try and help. And also don't forget your lifestyle triggers to try mm-hmm. and dampen yes. down the overactivity Get to all the brain. That settled too. So Katie had a chat with Lisa Burrow who is a specialist vestibular physiotherapist who has expertise in vestibular migraine about the role of physiotherapy in the treatment of this. I'm here today talking to Lisa Burrows who is a physiotherapist who is specially interested in vestibular migraine. Come. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you, Lisa. Um, so what we would like to do really is hear what you think is the the key points for people with vestibular migraine and how physiotherapists can get involved and help. Okay, so um, my particular role is quite unique in uh, the physiotherapy world. I'm a consultant physiotherapist in dizziness and balance and I work within an ENT outpatients. So we see patients that have dizziness associated usually with ENT problems. We are seeing an increasing number of vestibular migraines and they are equal in prevalence to BPPV in our clinics. So about 25 to 30% of our patients are uh, vestibular migraines in nature, which I think is is different to, say, if you were in a normal neurology clinic where it's about 10% of of headaches in, in neurology clinics are vestibular migraine. So who's making the diagnosis of vestibular migraine? Is it 
me. You, yes. <laughs> so when people get to you, you realise that actually yeah. it's vestibular migraine. That's why they're feeling so dizzy. Yeah. So just um, for our listeners, BPPV is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is also a very common thing, but very different from yeah. migraine. Yes, it is. So um, the key characteristics of BPPV are that you would get 30 seconds of dizziness, on head movements particularly you would notice it on looking up looking down rolling over in bed yep it's common um, in rolling over in bed i've certainly it, seen that a lot yeah that's the key question actually if, if you have dizziness rolling over in bed then that that's a an indication for me to use a whole pack dicks test and then that can be treated and really cured almost immediately in some people by an Epley's manoeuvre by an Epley manoeuvre or uh, a gaffoni if it's in the lateral canals so so that's very very different from uh, migraine what do you what gives you the clues that this is somebody with vestibular migraine rather than BPPV okay so it it's usually in the symptoms that they present with um in migraine patients they'll have dizziness that varies in time length so 30 percent of them will have dizziness for five minutes 10 minutes another 30 percent will have dizziness for up to six hours and then another 30 percent will have the main migraine symptoms for up to 72 hours yeah the 10 percent around that are, are involved with people that have dizziness for seconds and uh, weeks at right. the other end of the scale so a real and, variability yeah. in the effect and then of course in the impact on the patients yeah, because so, of their 10 minutes of dizziness is one thing but 72 hours of dizziness yeah. or even chronic dizziness that never really goes away people yeah. are really struggling and, and they have that refractory period where you know that the, the main bulk of the symptoms might only last 72 hours but the recovery from that can last weeks mm. weeks and weeks yeah um and and typically we're looking for associated symptoms to diagnose that have they had a history of migraine do they have a history of aura do they feel sick with it are they having any ringing fullness in their ears tinnitus and they don't have to have these symptoms at the same time but they can experience them at different times they don't follow a normal migraine with aura pattern they can happen in, in independent of each other um, migraine, um, we know generally, can change from attack to attack mm-hmm. and can change throughout a person's life. Yes. And so sometimes we see people with visual aura, with no headache, um, with other neurological symptoms, where, and the headaches can change in position. So, yeah, I think it's really about fi- listening carefully to the history and, uh, and finding out these clues. And, of course, family history of migraine is another thing we commonly find yes. with that. Do you think? Do you find that many of your patients with vestibular migraine have only dizziness and no headaches, or is that almost invariably a history of headaches? Uh, invariably, there's a history of migraine symptoms and migraine with visual or some kind of aura, but they do change over people people's lives, and we we find that at big hormonal changes, particularly in women. So we see uh, women that are menopausal mm. and they've had visual aura migraines and they've they've morphed into this dizzy type of yeah. migraine and they don't know what it is but as soon as you say migraine to them something clicks they go oh yes oh yes yeah. i ha- yeah it's funny you should say that i have a headache or you know it's around the time that i have my period or or a so, bit of brain fog yeah a bit of yeah. brain fog can't concentrate i feel fuzzy in my head not always a headache um, about 40% of patients with vestibular migraine do not have a headache. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that makes it so difficult to diagnose, yeah. and I think that's why people get uh, a long delay mm-hmm. uh, in diagnosis and sometimes sent all, all around different pathways before they get uh, a definitive Quite name. commonly, they'll, they'll have neck pain and shoulder pain. Yeah. So we talk about this headache sinking um, and, and they'll, they'll associate with that quite a lot. Right, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, neck and shoulder pain, I mm. think, are definitely or, linked together. And they'll describe ear pain. And uh, they'll, they'll say, I've, I've, I've got this, this, this earache um, around the back of my ear, ah. forgetting that the ear is on the head. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, you know, it doesn't know, it's count. Not, <laughs> it's not dissociated yeah. from it. It's actually on your head, but it's just been presented yeah. in, a, in a different way. 
when you've made the diagnosis of vestibular migraine, mm-hmm. had a conversation about it and explained it a bit, mm-hmm. what happens next? Um, they usually have lots of questions yeah. about whether this is really a migraine because you know I'm not having a headache with it, um, or are you sure this is not many years disease? Yes, because people Google. Yes, they do. They do Dr. use the Google. internet, um, and so we have a discussion about uh, observing progressive hearing loss for a differential diagnosis with many years disease, uh, and potentially there's an overlap of those two syndromes yes. in about forty to fifty p- percent of patients. Um, differentially diagnosing BPPV, about 5% of patients will have BPPV and vestibular migraines Mm -hmm. triggered by that. Uh, And then we we consider other things. Are there ocular motor triggers to it? Uh, We do ocular motor screening examinations. We look at sensitivity to uh, motion. Mm -hmm. And then we can use exercises to, to desensitize that, but we go very low and slow in the dosage. Um, We also discuss diet and lifestyle, cutting out caffeine. We look at medication. Are they uh, on tramadol, codeine? Yes, we are campaigning against those kind of things. Yeah. Um, Even regular paracetamol. You Mm -hmm. know, people will say, I'm not taking regular paracetamol. But when you dive a little bit further, they're taking it three, four, five times a week. So identifying these medication use headaches is really important. So detoxing the brain from some yes. of the overly used, even simple painkillers that you can buy over the counter yeah. can just really help the dizziness as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. And, and yeah. you know, I think the NICE guidelines suggest an abrupt withdrawal. Yeah. And um, we have really good success with that, but I yeah. have to warn them about that. The biggest concern is are there all of their other pains going to get much worse? And in my experience, they don't. Okay, that's reassuring. Yeah. Because we talking to patients about medication overuse and and the detox. If it's for headaches, Mm -hmm. we do sometimes get a worsening of the headaches when they come Mm -hmm. off. So we, Mm -hmm. again, as you said, we have to have a long conversation about explaining what's going on. Yeah, withdrawal headache. And we we have a conversation about... um, a withdrawal headache with caffeine as mm-hmm. well yep. because we ask them to abruptly withdraw that 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 accounts for about 40 percent of of, of migraine symptoms in this patient group so excellent so and what kind of um exercises would you be recommending is that something you can describe on a podcast or would we need a video for that? okay well we can have a go at describing them uh, we use something called um it depends on essentially what the patient has problems with so we try and be task specific and we tailor it to the patient and um, we do some vis- uh, vestibular ocular uh, reflex retraining okay which involves looking at a target and then moving your head right whilst you're looking at the target and keeping that firmly in focus so we the target's that. still but you're moving your eyes are, are your still eyes on are... the target and you're moving uh-huh. your head from yeah. side to side right uh, within a, a, a small range but that movement has to be about two a second and if you start to lose the focus of the target you need to slow it down a little if it's not hard to do you need to speed it up Uh we know that if we do them at a high dose then these exercises can actually trigger migraines if we do them at a low dose they don't help improve them yeah so the dosage of exercise exercise is is like drugs yeah you have to get the right prescription for the patient for that patient people are very sensitive aren't they and and uh, too much, too fast. Yeah. We do find people sometimes go mm-hmm. crazy doing the exercise and that makes things yeah. worse. So I always stress the favourite word over the rehab period is going to be moderation. Mm. And, and that's what we stress. And, and we also do sensory balance exercises. So getting them to tune into their balance organs in terms of uh, movement and activity without the visual cues. And then they've they've got some kind of idea of how their their body is moving without the the complication of visual information going in. So they're doing it with their eyes shut. Yeah. So uh, they do yeah. sit to stand with their eyes shut. They do balancing two feet together or one foot in front of the other. We add in head movements. We add in arm movements. We add in trunk rotations. All all specific to what that person needs to achieve in their daily life. That sounds amazing. So what kind of success rate? would you be looking to are you hoping that the dizziness will go are you hoping to improve it by say 50 percent what's your measures of outcome (laughs) so when we when when i see a patient um i have a guesstimate of how i feel they might improve over the next six weeks Mm -hmm. 
depending on the severity, whether they're episodic vestibular migraine or chronic vestibular migraine. If they're chronic, we we might be looking at a 20 to 30 percent. If it's medication use, I might be looking at an 80 percent improvement in their symptoms. If it's linked to caffeine, again, mm. I might be looking at a big improvement mm. relatively quickly. But if they've got ocular motor involvement and they're sensitive to ocular motor eye movements, then we might be looking at a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. If their episodes are frequent and severe, then again, we're going to be looking at a much longer period of time, maybe three to six months. Mm. I would say from our point of view um, at the National Migraine Centre, seeing, uh, suggesting things that people can try and uh, improve their migraine, we always say, you know, you have to be a bit patient. You have The brain doesn't change that quickly. No. And with medications and supplements and things, it's certainly you need to hang on in there for at least three months. Yes, and how often would they be doing the sort of exercises that you were describing? Would that be every day? Yeah, and we start with gently once a day, sometimes for 10 seconds, sometimes for 30 seconds, maybe two or three times in the day the next week. And then up up to within about six weeks, I would expect them to be able to do each of the exercises for a minute for up to five times a day. But again, I give them the opportunity to tailor that up or down and not to do it during an attack. Uh-huh, yeah. And then if you find that the vestibular migraine is really improving and settles down, I, um, I expect that you're finding, as we do, that sometimes migraine settles, you can have quite a prolonged period of time where you're not really bothered, and then it comes back again. So is that something you yeah, come across? Yeah, we see that quite quite commonly, and um, I would say we, we see a number of uh, patients that come back every few years maybe because they've had an exacerbation in their symptoms and they've not settled down um we always talk about having a setback plan on our first appointment so that they have a baseline Mm -hmm. of what their management strategy is and what their acute attack so a prevention strategy and acute attack strategy is and i always encourage them to write this down and keep it as a setback plan Uh, when they come back to me (laughs) <laughs> they invariably say, oh, no, I've lost the setback plan. What was it? <laughs> and we go right back to basics yeah. and, the, and the symptoms disappear again. And I always describe it as a three-month program or detox. It's not a life sentence. Yeah. And there are ways of reintroducing things into the diet and lifestyle. There are ways of, of increasing their exercise capacity quite gently yeah. so that they can cope with that. Um. But again, n- not to see it as <laughs> a kind of a sentence. A life sentence, it's, yeah. Um, so there's lots of hope. Yeah, and then yeah. have a setback plan. A, a, a significant amount of our patients improve. Yeah. Uh, and there's very, f- in fact, we have only about a 3% onward referral to neurology. Okay, that's so really... So, you know, I'm weird. an independent prescriber and I'm able to prescribe medications. Uh, we have some great guidelines in in the bash guidelines mm-hmm. the british association of newly updated uh, yeah yep. newly updated and and some nice guidelines and uh, within our trust we have a a document about prescribing in dizziness and balance Excellent. so this this really does help us progress patients through and in the uk are there lots of vestibular migraine physios like you okay so <laughs> or are they all all my patients going to have to come to you for this <laughs> so um I'm pretty unique uh, as a consultant physio working in this role. As an independent prescriber, I'm the only one in the country. Okay. We have a handful of physiotherapy-led balance clinics. Most most of these balance clinics lie in the domain of audiology, but that is moving, that is uh, transitioning. Mm. Uh, as a as a physio group, we have. About almost 500 members of our specialist interest group, which is ACPIVRA, the Association of Chartered Physiotherapists Interested in Vestibular Rehab. Uh-huh. But most of those are working in other specialisms, so neurology or musculoskeletal. And that that means that they're not seeing them all the time. I see thousands of patients mm. like this. So mm. I'm, I'm quite familiar with dizziness mm. and, and, and I'm I'm not scared by it. Whereas for, for a normal 
postgrad physio, it's not taught at all okay. on our degree. Yeah. So and like, there's it's no like my brain in general, I think yeah. there's a lack of education and yeah. understanding and I, in all sorts of areas of yeah. medical and, and professional and healthcare a, professionals. There's a big role for physiotherapists within he- headache management. Yeah. Definitely. You know, we look at cervical spine yep. relationships, we look at muscle activation, we look at visual ocular motor screening, we look at vestibular balance organs, we look at strength balance and conditioning, and we can do the, the cognitive behavioural stuff, the motivational stuff, the um, just tailoring it to that patient package. Mm. So I, I'd, I'd love more physios to be to be involved in this. I know they've got, is it... Um, Anne Marie Logan. Oh yes, Anne so, Marie. Yes. So we've got Anne Marie Logan, yeah. who's flying the flag. But I think across the country, we're very we're very short of it, and I and I do think we need to push. So we need to campaign areas. together. I think to yeah. to raise the awareness. Yeah. And just a, a final question about age. What age do people get vestibular migraine? In your experience, do you see children with it, or okay, is so it just more elderly patients? No, that there's no on the uh, diagnostic criteria for vestibular migraine. There's no age limitation on it. The majority of migraineurs will uh, experience their first onset between the ages of eighteen and fifty-five. Mm-hmm. Outside of that. I I tend to investigate people that develop migraines over the age of 55 or under the age of of 18. And I think that's fundamentally important to get the differential diagnosis correct. Um, And even now, I think people often confuse vestibular migraine with uh, migraine with brainstem auras. Mm. Um, You've got to listen to the patient. You've yeah. got to listen. Out. Do they have speech and swallowing problems at the same time? Do they follow traditional migraine patterns? But um, I, th- I think the biggest onset is in, in women. Yeah. And it's between those age groups. Yeah, I, w- I would agree. This is what we see in the clinic week after week. But of course, there is a wider yeah. age range. But yes, I agree with you with the yeah. you need to be on the safe side and just have. Yeah excluded other things yeah. if if it's not a typical history uh, and interestingly this week i've seen a patient who is a male and has a testosterone hormone replacement and when his injections die off he gets vestibular migraines oh, that's this so is, change in hormone yeah. levels in so, a man rather than in a woman which is what yeah. we typically see with yeah. the estrogen so we're getting um, endocrinology to look in more detail about maintaining his uh-huh. his testosterone yeah. levels yeah. um so you know it's interesting and it's developing all the time it's a fascinating topic. Thank you so much for that. That I know that our listeners are going to be absolutely fascinated by that talk. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Swati had a chat with one of our patients, and this is what they had to say about this. Hi, Shrey. Thank you for joining us on our podcast. Since you mentioned about the doctors saying that it was a complex migraine, what was it that was the differentiating uh, sort of symptoms from a normal migraine symptoms? What was the differentiating symptoms that um, made you feel that it wasn't just a migraine, it was something different from that? Um, I think it was also having um, the nausea and feeling really dizzy. So for me, I didn't really ask any questions, to be honest. I just got that diagnosis and took it with me. Okay. Um, and obviously, in my un- my last year of uni, I was diagnosed with having anxiety as well. So maybe they cross-related. Um, but I wasn't told anything particularly why they were complex. They just okay. said it was complex. And did you see any change in symptoms since then? So have your symptoms sort of changed? Oh, yeah, they've gotten worse, for okay. sure. Could um, you tell us a bit more about your symptoms? Yeah, yeah. Um, should I tell you from when I realised they changed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, in December, I had an ear infection. So prior to all of this, when I finished uni, my headaches, they pretty much went. Okay. Um, I would get the odd headache here and there, but it wasn't anything in particular. So um, I thought, great, I don't have migraines anymore. 
Um, and then uh, December 2018, I got an ear infection. Never had an ear infection in my life. And that was just really weird to have. I got antibiotics and thought that it would clear up within a week. And then that was December. Then in January, um, I went on like a weekend away, came back. And I just, this headache that I had was just awful. Like I'd never experienced a painful headache like that. And I was getting weird symptoms as well with it. So I was feeling really nauseous and really dizzy. Um, But it was quite severe. Like, it was like things were just spinning. Like, nothing was making sense. It was almost like I was not with it. Okay. Um, So I was like, right, let me go to A&E. Went to A&E. And the doctor there was just like, oh, um, so the headaches that you've got, um, because you're suffering with, like, a cold or flu, like, that's just one of the symptoms that you're having with the flu. And the dizziest and the nauseous, that's vertigo. You have vertigo, and that's from your ear infection. Um, just see how you go over the next couple, um, but it should clear up, you'll be fine. So I was like, oh, okay, cool, no problem. The, the doctor saying that, then I should be all right. And then from February, it just it just got worse. Um, literally, like, my headaches were mainly on the left side, um, and I was getting a lot of pressure behind my eye, like, sensitive to light. More balance, like, more of my weight balance was going to the left-hand side, and I felt like I was walking to the left. And it got to the point where I was actually asking people to, like, video me when I'm walking. Okay asking me like you know uh, does it look like I'm walking funny and I went to the doctors and yeah I wasn't really getting much feedback from them um, it must have felt really scary it was because it was just like it felt like am I making this up it got to a point where I was like am I going mad because I'm experiencing these physical symptoms yet no one's giving me an answer and I was taking painkillers and that wasn't doing anything. It maybe subsided the headache a little bit, but then it wasn't explaining all these other neurological pains that I was going through or symptoms. Okay. And I finally got another referral to a neurologist. Um, she didn't really do an examination either on me. She just kind of basically agreed with the doctors in when I saw them back in 2015-16 and said, you've got complex migraines. Oh, okay. And again, I was like, okay, but so this didn't time... didn't factor in the fact that you were having different symptoms from what you were having before? No, didn't have any examinations. Oh. She just said, you sound like you've got a, a combination of tension headaches. I uh, can't pronounce the sign. Your sinuses okay. um, and migraines of aura. And she gave, she said, let's try you on um, magnesium. I already had blood tests to say that I was vitamin D deficient. So take okay. those. Um, and see how you get on and if you need basically if you need us contact us wasn't really seeing much of a difference and from after that my symptoms were getting worse so I was getting all these internal tremors like I was literally just I just kept it was so weird like I'd never had it before but I just felt like I was always vibrating and my head was moving and like if I had like something in my hand like my hand was moving and I was like this has to be some sort of serious chronic disease that no one like people are missing here it was just awful absolutely awful so how did you kind of understand that it was vestibular migraine how did you understand that found it by accident (laughs) found it by accident um so with my anxiety I'm a serial googler so I just started to google my symptoms because I was like I know this is probably not the best answer, okay. but at least I'll have some sort okay. of, like, something. Yeah. someone must be going through this. Sure. Um, and obviously, Google gives you all the scary stuff. You've got Parkinson's, you've got your central yeah. tremors, you've got MS. And then I went onto YouTube, and I typed in internal tremors, because those were the things that was bothering me the most. Um, and obviously, you had the internal uh, essential tremors and stuff. And then I clicked on this video by accident, and it was... Um, supplement for internal vibrations and I clicked on it very by accident and it was this girl and she was basically saying that these are one of the symptoms that she was having with her vestibular migraines and I was like what is vestibular migraines very few people know about that literally and when I heard her story I literally burst out into tears because I was like finally I have found someone who is going through what I'm going through And then I just found a whole massive community of people that's got vestibular migraines. And it was just, it was upsetting to know that they were going for it. But it was also a breakthrough for me because it was just like, I finally can get some sort of treatment plan to get back onto who I was before going through all of this stuff. Um, Also, I feel like that community part that you just said, Mm. sometimes 
knowing the fact that you're not alone. Yes. Somebody else, not saying in the sense that you want more people to suffer from no. it, but knowing that somebody else understands what you are going through. Exactly. Kind of helps with your own anxiety issues. I feel like when you read all this stuff and you read all this things on Google, you just keep the anxiety sort of builds in more and more. Right, right. And once you sort of know that there are other people out there who get the same symptoms, who've got the same problem, you kind of get that whole yeah. factor yeah yeah that was it? literally it gave me hope because it was like okay I, when I can go to see you guys I can actually talk about it and yeah. actually be confident that potentially this is what I'm going through rather than coming from not knowing anything and still thinking I've got MS or something like that okay um and it's definitely eased my anxiety I just feel happy to be honest like I actually feel so much better because I feel like I can see a road to recovery Perfect. So today when you had a conversation with one of our doctors, mm-hmm. I think you spoke to Dr. Monroe today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so is it now finally, so because you how you, how you self-diagnosed it mm-hmm. to be vestibular migraines, has that now been confirmed yeah. by Dr. Monroe? she said okay. that she believes that it is chronic migraines with vestibular symptoms. Okay. So that was really great um, to actually get a confirmation. Um, and she's given me... a preventative plan that I can start using today okay. um, to look at ways on how to reduce my symptoms like my dizziness and things like that and to calm my nerves and stuff um, so yeah I'm just excited to get these stuff so I can feel better like sure, even I know that I may not be a hundred percent but if I could just feel like 60 70 percent I'll be happy yeah so yeah Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story You're with welcome. us. Thank and you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode about vestibular migraine. Our next episode will be concentrating more on children and migraine. Uh, there are some things which are similar and some things which are quite different. Uh, and we've got a couple of kids telling us about their own experiences of migraine. So join us next time for the next episode. You've been listening to the Heads Up Podcast. If you want more information or have any comments, email us on info at nationalmigrainecenter.org.uk. Till next time.